tonight, and I want to welcome everyone here on her behalf as well as my own, and um, to say that um, some poetry project things, which are that next Monday, Michael Peel will be here on Monday. Michael is um, a musicologist who is primarily centered in his teaching job at Yale, but who has become the sort of primary commenter on Fela um, because he's Fela's primary biographer. He's been working on Jamaican Dub, and he's most recently um, been writing about John Coltrane, so he's going to be giving a talk here, the very first talk of the Monday Night Reading series since I've been curating um, about the free music of John Coltrane. So I'm excited that he'll be here next week. And of course, on Wednesday, um, the Wednesday Night series will host the poet artist collaboration work of Lucy Scalabino here. So we're all really excited for that. So hope to see you later in the week. So I'm going to introduce Juana, and uh, I'm going to turn the program over to her after I say a few things about her. Um, Afgava is, um, as you know, um, a journal that is the primary project of Litmus Press in some ways, and it brings together poets and translators and artists um, in one space and also in one usually issue. Um, this is not the first time that Litmus or Afgava has presented a sort of mini festival like tonight's. They've also done festivals for Brazil and Italy and Poland. Um, and Tracy's, of course, very excited about Alcala 12, and she's asked me to convey her gratitude to her, who um, she says, quote, easy to work with, meticulous, and incredibly intelligent as a guest editor of this, this number of Alcala. So. Um, I also want to announce the digital launch of Alcala 1 through 6, which uh, all three are now available online, the entire numbers are available online. Uh, with the suggested donation in support of the digitization of Afgawa in the future. And with that, Juana Abasili Kiai. Oh, good. <laughs> Her work traverses public space, textual architecture, multilingualism, sound, and collaborative performance. Recent editing projects include the Mapping Issue and a series of commentaries on Canadian experimental poetry for Jacket 2. She is translated from the work of Quebecois writers, including Jean de Derosier, Jean Marc Degon, Steve Savage, Luis Colmar, and Daniel Canty, as well as from the Romanian of Paul Salon and Nikita Stemsu. She is also played in the bounds of translation and creation in a poetic collaboration with Erin Moray. Her most recent poetic book project is We Beasts, and her audio work can be found on Penn Sound. Please welcome. A cactus flower in a spruce heart, or the story of a Quebecois wandering south of the earth. Jesus, what a mess, for Christ's sake. The days when destruction becomes a peace. You could kill everything that kills itself, even ground beef even puppies, even trees. And especially, especially, the tranquil barges swaying on waters no less tranquil. I don't want to see anyone I can't destroy, so I'll remain alone with my exhausting and useless heat and a lifelike music. Damn it, damn it, damn it, the only thing that shivers is my liver. I weep for my nervousness, I weep for my virginity, and I shed no tears. That was from, um, that was for Christ's sake, translated from Chris by uh, jean pierre Derosier, who's the uh, poet that opens this selection. The selection of this work, 14 writers translated by 12 translators, is based on which poetries in Quebec's francophone literary weather feel vital right now, which works seem utterly relevant and current to this moment, which is always a multiple and refractive moment, which poetries are speaking, calling, urging, moaning, crying to the reader in us, 
which works in their lexicons and syntax, their movements and music, wake us up, make us feel excited and alive in language. In short, which poetries give a damn. Living and writing in Quebec means living in a linguistic here that is aware of, very, of a very different linguistic there. Being in the rub between languages, being in a French that is alert to a non-French, and a French that has had a complicated, troubled, and rebellious relationship with continental French. It is thus a place of hybrid identity and hybrid poetic experiments, which often breach the boundaries between different fields and genres. In writing their translations, the translators inflect French into various Englishes, transforming that here into a there, which is thus made into a new here. They are responsive in postures and responsible transgressions into what Rosemary Waldrop calls the game, I quote, the game of translation, the stakes of translation, the travail of translation, the hard work of travel through the boundless space of a book on the other side of the border. Go expecting trouble. Go out prepared. Nicole Brossard, through her 30 books of poetry, fiction, and essays translated into many languages, here by writers Aaron Moray and Robert Benzels, has relentlessly troubled languages being. Its political sexuality, its beauty and discord, made turbulent her syntax, because to do otherwise is impossible, because language is alive, its breath of joy, privilege, and struggle. Also, it is a curiosity into which Franz Schurch, author of several collections of poetry and fiction, enters philosophically, not in a singular, but in a swarm, approaching a thought from all sides, entering it as it enters him, syntactically oblique in now's future, responding to the moral imperative of feeling such entering exactly. An exactness explored in English here by one of the fluid identities and delinquent authorial personas of poet, philosopher, artist, translator Ingrid Pam Dick, whose transgenre work does philosophy as lit, lit as translation, sibling German or French or English into English, scoring one text into another text. Together, Ingrid Pam Dick and I, walked into Ludwig Wittgenstein's house to follow the tracks that Suzanne LeBlanc, philosopher, scholar, and visual artist, maps in its linguistically imagined rooms to build a first book house of being in self and being in world, explore, to explore the reflective and fraught music of bringing the exterior inside and the interior outside. So first, no poems. Thank you very much, Joanna. Thank you for putting this, uh, editing this section of poetry from Quebec in translation. I think uh, it is an important moment because I believe it renews the questions in English as well as in French. And I'm quite sure there will be a future to that section to have to care for of Gabi. Um, I will also say that it keeps me younger to <laughs> be in that edition. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so this is the text which is in the um, in the And it starts with a quote by Seneca. And we've not degenerated. Alphabet of drifts, language, vibrates. Language vibrates in its own music of ancient vows, of aura and flux of feelings. Thus, our mouth learned a form of abstraction that resurges vast in the chest, each little impulse of fauna sapiens and salt. So art returns to carve into the unspeakable a scapula of sheep with Chinese characters, a vigorous bloom of bread infinite. Language, art, rain, 
fall in the very depth of our gestures. We do not forget forest, cranium, sea, each of our comparisons over the centuries, our streaming verticality. Being in language splashing across Lorient Occident, speeding in scenery with a lip quick sound quick me, not knowing if wall to wall feels close, no answer, serious thoughts of pink and petals in the next room, you play piano, key fingers of invention, next, questions rolling until democracy becomes a verb. How many words vanish at the moment we become a group, alive, obsolete, alive, word, want, rebondi, somebody else, Crowd for them, ruthless crowd. The silk of anecdotes, the glass broken, presque. This knowledge grazed by sobs. We recentered our gestures, our consensus. People have dialogues, have shivers, having the throat, having the chest, two or three tears, two pulpy responses, have vertigo of joyful atoms. Therefore, surge of catastrophe. Guess, guess, if I live among slaves. If you stumble into the secret, avowal, apnea, vertigo, know that from the crack of down, you have to gravitate to avoid suffering. But an hour later, we say the opposite. If the rain if a bodily object broke before our eyes. Then we rearm vertigo, stand up, bend an ear in the morning, already full of tricks, rubbed up against thoughts. So this morning, here's a copy of Dawn in its own dawn, a practice of time grazed slightly that obliges us to address ours intimately, though we can't see them. For neither paragraphs, nor version with your body, nor all that went past warned news and lumière, or the muted noise of fountains, cannot lead back where hours began again to be other hours with a book, an hour more, a dream within cannot be freer than myself as far as the eye can see, but abridged, a democracy breaks like an egg, cannot find its adjectives of energy renewed against lies and lonelies, the sound of throats and crowds. It's been a long time since I wrote the word face. I'm asked if by chance I know who we're talking about. I'm told to speak from within. Another word, another polite address. Beautiful flash mob, show me your ground zero, your tally of sorrows. The earth has gone through an idea more than once of grand vigilance and vestige. We're born all over again, our language put to the test. Beautiful mom, first show me your women, then your tears, your tally of sorrows. And I will read a poem in French, and um, it will be in English with me. So it's about the alphabet, and you will hear two letters, D, L, et le P. Lèvre il a longtemps, liqueur de lumière et de littérature, au petit des arts de l'ido, lobby dans mon lexique de lions de questions. Au bord des lèvres lesbiennes, longtemps libre de larmes, sous l'azur, la pile azurie, je me l'envie d'un coup de l'orgue doux et de bleu. Mmh. 
longtemps je fis cette lecture de la lune et de l'angle lointaine lyrique. The indocile bank of words. Long time lilac lips, liquor of light and literature, or little lizard of the Lido, now long sandbar at the mouth of a bay that shelters a lagoon, louvered in my lion lexicon of questions. Long time on lesbian lips, let loose from tears under lapis lazuli light, I long to lick sweet lobe and lucum. Long time I leaned into this reading of lyric lagoon and language long ago. And I think I can pronounce the P. Uh, so, the P. For all the passions in the present, possible for promenade, we plunged into panoramas with phrases, ponderings, with the power of perfume and paradox, possibly particles of dust. Say it's from Pekin or Palmyra or Pompeii, we partook in its plenitude proposed to physically possessed poetry. All these texts have been translated by Erin Murray and Robert Maisel, and I will read uh, the last one, uh, which is from a novel, Fences in Reading, and the translation is by Suzanne de Lopinia Harwood. Stay alive, says the voice, also applies to all girls. Whoever you are, stay alive because of the smooth wind through the roses and through your raptures. Stay alive. Show yourself with your syllables and your images. Don't be afraid to touch your melancholy. Stay alive. Despite the flies and the burns, the little decorations. Stay alive. Arms open like pages of the dictionary. Breathe high and loud between the signs, the mirrors, the little sketches. Don't forget your Greek and Latin grammar. Stay alive, despite your mother in her bathtub, terrorists and liars. Stay alive, in the moon's axis, and touch, go ahead, touch your mirrors in the right places before watching yourself leave. Stay alive like someone who is not you. Thank you very much. Demain me frappe de tous les côtés et j'ai des lèvres bien minces pour qui doit embrasser tant de coups. À toutes les fois que j'ai l'impression d'être bien en contrôle de mon présent, je suis une mauvaise gifle car il n'y a rien de présent. Je suis dans l'avenir si je suis inconscient et le passé m'est inconnu de toute manière. Tomorrow hits me from all sides, and I have really thin lips for one who ought to kiss so many shots. Every time I have the feeling of being in control of my present, I'm a bad slap. Because nothing is present. I am in the future if I'm unconscious, and the past is unknown to me anyway. What did you do yesterday? I don't remember. And what are you doing today? I don't remember that either. All right, but... But what? But what are you doing tomorrow? Tomorrow is far off. I didn't do anything yesterday or today. It could be I won't have anything to do tomorrow. In fact, I came here to wait. 
I came, I am here, and I am waiting. With the past, the present, and the future perfectly assembled and explaining themselves to one another. So, so, so what are you waiting for from me? So what more are you waiting for? I am waiting for what you say to mean something. It could be you'll wait a long time. I've been waiting a long time already. It's certain that I will be dead soon. You will be dead also. And curiously, that disturbs me more. I don't remember anything. All the joints I have are stiff from holding fast to the present moments I await, and I have no reason for waiting. There are all sorts of things around you in invisible colors. It seems that they move at their speed. I'm not certain. All the speeds are colored, and I am afraid of not knowing how to distinguish the pieces which shoot from you from those which turn rapidly to the outside. You are not a piece, and I don't see anything around you, which unsettles me greatly and makes my eyes hurt. I don't owe anything to anyone, and what you are doing there, invisible behind the tree branches at the corner, for a long time, I have not been calm. I don't know what I'm doing, and I eat my fingernails. I got up this morning, had coffee, went outside to go shopping. I've gotten up very often since I've been alive. I don't remember the first time for a long time. I've been agitated. It is very difficult to say exactly why, even today, when I know how to speak, it is strange that the things I don't know without knowing why make my feet tremble when I don't have anything to do. It is strange without awaiting something precise that I bite my fingernails. The things that I don't know force me, bite me often. Exactly today, I don't owe anything to anyone. I already said that. But it is strange that I am being shoved from who knows where. Duty, where does it come from? Do I owe myself something? Could I owe something to someone else? I am shaken, it's obvious, since I am being moved without wanting it. It's well known, I already said that, to you even gnawing my own fingertips. But how come? Because I am being pushed somewhere? How come? Because it's necessary for me to do something? How come? It would mean that I owe. And how could I owe if I don't know how to respond? I don't know how to respond. I do not know. I don't know what is being demanded of me. I don't know what to do. It is very obvious, I already told you since I bite my fingernails, the duty is not not knowing how to respond. I can't owe anything since precisely, I don't know, do not even know what's being spoken of here. To be unsettled about not knowing how to respond, that is not the duty. So then, what do you want it to be? I don't want anything. I don't owe anything to anyone. You are really shaken, though, and you ask a lot of questions for one who doesn't owe anything. I walked outside today. There was plenty of air. Air is interesting since we don't feel it all when it enters. And it is good for one's health. Some prefer, I've been told, the smoke of the fire we feel. It is a curiosity. Curiosity cannot be an error. And even it could be, it is a more learned way of biting one's fingernails that one acquires by approaching the fire to feel what enters us cannot be an error. The stomach of the stomach that dissolves in what it eats, the mouth of the protozoan that wanted more than the mash it is ever since it stopped being hungry, do not say anything else. It could be we really owe it. 
to what enters us to feel it exactly. J'admirais sa vie, c'était une maison simple et austère, et j'étais rigoureuse et grandite. Office, près de chaussée. Chorale 1. It was a house of which I knew nothing but the plans and several images. It had been constructed at the beginning of my century, the 20th, in a city, Vienna, which proved decisive. That was well before I was born by way of a philosopher whom I read at length much later. His work had convinced me. I admired his life. The house was simple and austere, and I was rigorous and frank. Pantry, ground floor. Kohal, three. The house was a method. It was exact and simple. It was austere and obsessive. It issued from a life consecrated to the life of the mind. I cherished a neglected house. It was a house of the mind in which my method lived. I saw its coherence alongside that of the philosopher. His work was convincing, his life admirable. I saw it in the hallways of his house my method, my mind. Servants bedroom ground floor. Foundation two. Imagining a general game to motivate her part in the human games in which she was caught took priority in P's existence. This had a foundational cause, an originating event, or, if one prefers, a primary motor, born of a mix of circumstances which, like the chemistry initiating life on a planet, owed the encounter of its congruent parts, the formation of its internal coherence, to chance. It was rather remarkable that this event occurred in the same place as her birth, a short interval later on a terrain as if prepared to consummate the rupture which the initial detachment had commenced. For 10 days, P was removed from her father and mother, isolated from the family and kept in an unknown clinical environment. The panic, despair, terror were seismic. Like a plate detaching from a matricial continent, P's life separated from that of her family, which she never again took for granted. God required seven days to create the world, according to the Old Testament. P required ten to lay the groundwork for her definitive universe. The latter was turned entirely toward representation, whose figures and relations proliferated like the minerals, flora, fauna, and then humankind in the biblical universe. A solitude arose, conscious of the external things she absolutely needed and which her representations sought to attain. As a corollary, an autarchy emerged, establishing a singular regard that could no longer be deconstituted. Governess's bedroom, third floor. Foundation 15. Throughout the 20 years that elapsed before the forming of the First Alliance, P lived alone. After the forming of this alliance, she lived alone differently. She didn't fall asleep cradled by thoughts of someone in whom she imagined love. She lay down and dozed in the cocoon of the world. Thus, it was not the nights in their dreams that the new bond came to inhabit, but the days. It was there, in waking life, that it made a difference. Most importantly, this friendship introduced conversations into P's universe. 
In fact, the relationship between P and Professor S consisted entirely in what can be considered a unique conversation. Initiated the evening of the Alliance and pursued through what would amount to thousands of hours. P and Professor S eating fine or frugal and often exotic meals together, strolling in cities and in forests, and for the vast majority of the time, listening and speaking to each other by long distance phone, connected to one another by this cable made for the commerce of language, for its structure and for its flesh, because the eardrum is also tactile. Developing out of these long acoustic sequences, the temporal topography, the tectonics of sense, going over them again if the exchange demanded it, and perpetually practicing what involved in turn the solution of the problem and the code of wisdom. This conversational mode exactly suited the idea that P had formed about the relation to others. Something exchanged between two aloofnesses, a barter bearing thresholds of proximity, compromise, commitment, movements, of freedom where one gives all and demands nothing, slow or hasty retreats, but always crucially, this recognition of the other's exoticism, of their surprising logic, and in all in all, of their absolute prerogative as to their own invention on their own territory. The exchange was made between Lord and Lord. Whatever the other's position in society, for it is always in the absolute that two beings truly meet, in such a way that if they leave the function, standing or any other position of power, or who knows what standard or measure that is capturing their mind or body and filtering their part in the exchange, this would be ascribed to them entirely. Nothing, therefore, can unseat them but their own false movements, which they are free to accept without this honor, or to devote some or all of their existence to changing. East bedroom, second floor. Wittgenstein um, continues to obsess and infiltrate the process-based process work of Steve Savage, author of several collections of poetic transgressions, published and in the making, as he collaborates, translates, and tones across texts, sound, and medias to create new beings of linguistic behavior across the lexical barriers of French, English, and authorial personas. One of his collaborators is René Gagnon, author of several books who turn cinema into text text into multimedia performances and soundscapes, English pop culture's vernaculars into Quebec's political complexities, and whose montage poem addressed to American icon Steve McQueen comes here as both script and score. Interpreted by poet-translator Bronwyn Haslam, whose previous vigorous meticulous translations include some anagrammatic translations of poems by Nicole Brossard. And then the evening will conclude with poet critic Jean-Marc Desjardins, who, through 20 books of poetry, essays, and criticisms, and translated here by Jen Hutton, has relentlessly mattered languages politics with vigor and panic, with wine, sacredness, and risk, pressing, vulnerable, yet probing against French's various syntaxes daring to bear the burden of the question, what does it matter now? Merci, Oana. Bonsoir. I don't know if I'm obsessed with Wittgenstein, but today in the children's bookstore I found this. Dr. Abbott. <laughs> So people know that it's time to know about this. And this goes to my children as well. Okay, let me present myself. This is an excerpt of a translation from French of a Google search using the keywords savage and savage is. I wrote two kind of novels using the same principle, John Smith in English and Nathalie in French. 
Savage is born in Columbus, Ohio, to Angelo Pofo, an Italian American Catholic, and Judy, a Jewish American. Savage is a fictional character. Savage is gold. Savage is dying in Shibugami. Savage is an actor. Savage is an herpetologist. Savage is an immortal criminal. Savage is a dad. Savage is out. Savage is an actress. Savage is translated into French. Savage is a hero whose diction is particular. Savage is also the host of Nigerian Idol. Savage is a vigilante halfway between Superman and Yul Brenner. Savage is forgotten by French publishing houses. Savage is the power clause. A sour savage is beautiful, versatile, and tough. Savage is in stable condition. Savage is an opera in three acts. Savage is ugly. Savage is incredibly easy to do. Savage is the youngest diagnosed. Savage is ready. Savage is probably more radical. Savage is the last of the stars whose phone was hacked. Savage is a good hunting rifle. Savage is a machine with which you are having fun. Savage is dirty. Savage is too short, too small, too soft, and too high. Savage is even better than I thought. Savage arrived in Mauritius on Monday morning, Monday morning after rowing five months. Savage is left to join the paradise of stars. Savage is a small modern tale. Savage is more general and may seem more natural. Savage is complex, it is not for fun. Savage is the target of an attack orchestrated by Honky Tonk Man. <laughs> Savage is expanding. Savage is in total disassembly mode. Savage is also the editor of the cultural weekly, The Stranger. Savage is a good machine. Savage is the best and not the last. Savage is precisely their realization. Savage is a real tribute. Savage is highlighted. Savage is the most complete, in my opinion,